Uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap and welcome him tonight. <laughs> Praise God. You may be seated, and let's keep digging into this, uh, this book of, um, of John. Uh, I'd like to start tonight. We're going we're gonna to talk about the fact that it's one thing that Jesus has come and grace and truth has come, but here's the one thing we got to get. Man must accept it. He's got to accept Jesus him being full of grace and truth. And, and I want to read out of, let's start at John chapter 1, verse 10 through 13. John chapter 1, uh, verse 10 through 13. And let's, let's call this man's acceptance of grace. Man's acceptance of grace. So that's the teaching for tonight. And in verse 10, he says, he was in the world. Jesus was. We, we know him as the light. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, Jesus, the light, okay? And the world, watch this, they knew him not. So, so, so here's the deal. God was in the world, and they didn't know he was in the world. God was in the world through Jesus Christ. The light was in the world, and the world didn't know it. They didn't know him. They knew him not. Verse 11, he says, he came unto his own. Now, here it is making reference to, to Jewish people. So he was, Jewish people are referred to as, as his own, his tribe. He came unto his own, and watch this, and his own received him not. He came to him. world didn't know him. He came to his own people. They didn't receive him. And then next verse, but as many as received him. So the issue is not knowing him and not receiving him. All right? It's one thing for us to know about him, to have all the scriptures about him and everything. Have you received him? And here's what he says. As many as received him, he gives them power to become the sons of God. You, by, be, by receiving Jesus, have an opportunity to become a species that no, no, no spiritual creation or physical creation has ever encountered before. Sons of God. So the Son of God, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. And here he says, even to them that believe on his name. So those who receive God and those who believe on his name, something outstanding happens. They become this amazing, brand new class, sons of God. Ain't nobody ever seen that before. Angels are angels, men of men, but sons of God. All right, now, now watch this. I want to look at three scriptures real quick because everything that God did, he did it for every man. But not every man received what he did. Let's look at this real quick. Let's look at the book of, um, <clears throat> let's see, chapter 1 here, since we're there, verse 9. John chapter 1 and verse 9, just back up there. He says, that was the true light, <clears throat> which lighteth, watch this, every man that cometh into the world. The true light was ready for every man that cometh into the world. So he did that for every man. Look at Hebrews 2 and 9. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. I want you to notice he's doing it for every man. He says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for, watch this, every man. Look at what he's doing for every man. And then Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Titus chapter 2 Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to who? All men. 
So notice what God did. He did it for every man. Every man that's come on the earth, God has made it available to every man. But this doesn't mean that every member of the human race became a partaker of grace. You know, he made himself available to everyone, but not everyone received him. He made himself available to every man, but not every man accepted him. So there's a different reaction on the part of man to God's offer of grace in the person of Jesus Christ. The world know, knew him not, knows him not. And those who called his, called, he, that, that he called his own received him not, but there are some who do receive him and some who didn't receive him. And that's the, that's the, the, the foundation of where we're gonna, gonna deal with it. And I've never dealt with just that little issue, but I think it's a, this little issue, I'm gonna show you how it blows up to a big issue. And I told you that in this series, we're dealing with every little crack and corner of the book of St. John. And tonight, we're looking at who's accepting him and who hadn't accepted him. What happens when you accept him and what happens when you don't? What does it really mean to accept him and to receive him? All of those things, it, uh, it just can't become something that we uh, sit around spontificating about. We've got to look at what we're saying and then ask ourselves the question, what does that look like in my everyday life? Okay, so once again, let's go to verse 10. Uh, in, in chapter 1, he says he was, uh, uh, John chapter 1, he said he was in the world, and the world was, was, was made by him, and he says, and the world knew him not, because the world does not know him, because the world does not know Jesus. Listen to me carefully. This is huge. Because the world does not know Jesus, grace cannot rule in it, in their life, unto eternal life. Tonight, we're going to find out, we got to find out what eternal life is. For this is life eternal. Let, let, look at verse 17. Let's, let's in John chapter 17, verse 3. I, I always settled, I was always settled with the explanation that eternal life was just living forever. It is so much more than that. And you're going to see it right here in the scripture. He says, and this is life eternal. Look what he says. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So watch what he says. He says, those that know him, those that have accepted him, those who know him, know the, know, know the true God, <clears throat> he says, they have eternal life. So all of a certain, eternal life is not a time issue. It's a person issue. They that know him have eternal life. I want you to know the day you got born again, that was the day you started eternal life. You have eternal life when you come to know Jesus. And, and, and you need to keep that as you go throughout Scripture and go throughout your study. I know Jesus. I've received Jesus. I have eternal life. Don't just settle with the fact that I got born again so I can live forever. No, your eternity is in Jesus. Jesus is eternity, praise God. He was at the beginning, in the middle, on the earth, and he's still here. No Jesus, no eternal life. For this is eternal life that you've come to know and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the world, you know, they don't recognize it. But it's amazing about all the things they do recognize. But they've not yet come to the point of recognizing who Jesus is. The world does not know him. They don't know the Jesus that is full of grace and truth. And when you don't know the Jesus that's full of grace and truth, check it out. It cannot, you cannot, you will not know grace as long as you find sufficiency and merit in mankind. As long as you see that your answer and your sufficiency is in what you know and, and in mankind, you won't know grace. As long as the things that you go through in life that you have been trained and equipped to believe, I got this. I know this, I got an education, I've experienced this, I know how to do that, and all that may be true, 
but you are limiting because of of, 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 of what you know and the merits of man, your, your, your belief that I can bring the solution to everything to the table, you're limiting ever really knowing this grace and truth. Because this grace and truth, we're going to go right back to what we've been talking about, but we're going to prove it tonight. This is all about setting your life up to be, to be dependent upon God. So you got to ask the question, am I on purpose setting my life up on a day-to-day -day basis to depend upon God. Because that's going to, we, we got to deal with this issue of, oh, praise the Lord, I'm saved, and you are, and all that kind of stuff. I have no doubt about that. But we really need to ask, what does that look like? What does that look like? In verse 11, John chapter 1, he came unto his own, again, his own received him not, referring to the Jewish people, but I want to take you somewhere in the book of Exodus, chapter 19 and verse 8. See, they didn't know, receive Jesus at the time. But you know what the Jewish people received right away? The law. When the law was given to Israel, they received it. When Jesus came, they didn't even know him, nor did they receive him. And now watch this careful, because... Uh, you're actually going to begin to see why God allowed the law to come in in the first place. One simple thing blew my mind when I saw it. If you have time, I want you to read chapter 19, 20, 21, 22, because you're gonna, you read this and then you keep reading, you're like, what ticked God off? <laughs> all of a sudden, all this wonderful stuff is talking about, and all of a sudden he's saying, all right, y'all need to build a boundary, and you better not touch not even the bottom of the mountain, mountain or you're going to fall dead. I'm going to tell you that right now. Oh, you want to hear from me? He come down, and they're in torment. Like, please tell him don't speak to us no more. You, you tell him to give the message to you, Moses, and you come tell us. And then he start issuing out of all this law. You do this, you're going to die. You do that, you're going to die. If you don't do this, you're going to die. And if you do this with him, both of y'all going to die. I'm like, what? Make what rubbed him the wrong way. Look at this. And all the people answered together, and they said, now, this is interesting because, uh, let's back up to verse 7 so we can get the context in here. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. So God's delivering a message here. They hear the message, verse 8. And all the people answered together, and they said, now listen to this, all that the Lord has spoken, hear these three words, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Go to verse 9. Let's just, just, just show you what happened. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with them and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord's ear. So now he's telling people like he already knew. But he's saying, you know, they heard your words and they say, yeah, we can do that. All right, now watch this. Next verse. And the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people, sanctify them today, tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. It's going to be on and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, take heed to yourself that you go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. What happened? You can't see grace if you continue to see and depend on your ability. You can't see it. That's what happened. And in the next chapter, starting right here, he brings the law. Why did he bring the law? He says, you think you all that? I'm going to give you something so perfect and so flawless that we ain't going to be able to do nothing without me. 
and I'm going to send you this perfect, flawless law that I already know you can't keep. And what people don't understand is the millions of folks that died under the law because they couldn't keep it. And this thing went on until one day they made their mind up, we need you. So the Bible says we should exalt the law. Why? Because without the law, we would have never come to the place of understanding our need for a Savior. And because most people miss that little, that little three words, we shall do, then they have no idea why the law was put in, but it was put in to bring man to the end of his self so that he will understand you can't do nothing without me. All right? I am the God of all grace and mercy. So when the word full of grace and truth came, they received him not because they still desired to establish their own righteousness by doing the things that were demanded of the law. Look at Romans 10, verse 3 through 5 real quick. Still wanting to establish their own righteousness by doing the things demanded by the law. That's what religion is today. In religious churches, there are Christian people that still want to establish their own righteousness by doing things that are demanded in the law. Romans chapter 10 and verses 3 through 5 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have, submit, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that, watch, believeth. Verse 5, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which do doeth those things shall live by them. They were trusting in themselves, and they were unwilling to acknowledge their own inability to measure up to God's requirements. And we're living the same way today. I'm telling you about the grace of God, and I'm telling you how you need to depend on the grace of God, and I'm telling you you're not going to be able to do this without God, and I'm telling you you need to depend on God, and we are still going around saying, no, I can prove to you that I can do this by myself. I can establish my own righteousness, and you can't. And then you deceive yourself by judging other people without recognizing that you got your own issues because you've convinced yourself, no, I don't. I can fulfill God's requirement without him. So you're committing the greatest sin in the Bible. What is that? Trying to be like God without God. Are you listening to me? trying to measure up instead of acknowledging I don't have the ability to measure up to God's requirements. And, and, and church, church has taught you so that, yes, you do, you don't. Even when I first, uh, 12 years ago, understood the grace of God, I still kept fighting this thing of trying to measure up to God's requirements on my own. Now, today, I can't do it. And you know, I, and, and you know it's not like because I didn't give a valiant effort. I did. And, and it, it went, sometimes for months. And then I realized I can't do it. Because as long as you realize you can do it, when you mess up, uh, you'll have this tremendous guilt and condemnation that says you're not enough. And the truth is, like I said Sunday, you're right, you're not enough. And watch this, without God, you are never going to be enough. That's the message of grace. You're never going to be enough. And so somehow what we have to do in all of our inferiority and all of our uh, lacking this or that, that's, that, that now really drives us to the place where I, I got to depend on God. And, and you know what I'm learning? I'm learning there's a difference between talking this stuff in church and then actually experiencing it in life. You know? God spoke to me. He says, I want to get to know you as you're living, not in a compartmentalized position in your closet every day for 30 minutes. He says, don't compartmentalize our relationship. 
I want our relationship to be the good and the bad and the ugly of the day. I want, I want it to be the good, the bad, and the ugly of the day. And, and I want you to look at your life and, and, and when you're weak and when you're dogged out and when, you, when you've fallen and when you failed and when the devil says, you know, stay home, don't pray, don't have nothing to do with God, don't go to church, you know, you've been enough, you need to, you need to, I've always told, you know, when you go through something, you need to stay away from church, you need to go somewhere and get restored. No, 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 I have been restored and in my living, I'm saying, God, help me. I failed, it hurt, I didn't want to get up, but I'm going to get my butt up because I depend on you. And when I am weak, that's when I am strong. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Quit compartmentalizing your relationship with God 30 minutes in the morning in prayer, an hour in the morning in prayer, and then you leave that 30 minutes or an hour, and you ain't got nothing to do with God no more until the next morning where you enter into that closet to compartmentalize your relationship with God. Imagine if you did that with real people. The relationships would stink. Why? Because you're only compartmentalizing that, but throughout the day, you have no communion in that relationship. I don't want a relationship like that with God. I don't mind. I was, I was looking for a broadcast one day, and, and I saw some clickbait. The messy life of Creflo Dollar. I'm like, you got that right. It was messy. <laughs> I ain't had no problem with it. Didn't bother me at all. I agreed quickly. It was messy. And you know what? The mess still not going to be gone until Jesus comes back. There's, there's going to be something, something else in your life that you're going to confront, whether it's your attitude, whether it's your mouth, whether it's your emotions or your feelings, something you're going to confront where you're going to say, ha ha, I still need you. But don't ever get to the place where you say, we can do this. I can do this. I always want to get to the place where I'm saying, I hear, what you, I hear what you told me to do. I can't do this without you. I want to get to the place where you can say, Lord, I'm not enough by myself. But with you, I can do all things. That's what, in, in a lack of better terms, that's, that turns him on. I mean, he's turned on all the time. But when his creation comes back to the place where they are in total reliance upon him. Then you go to bed at night, you go to bed tonight, and you look forward to tomorrow. God's going to make me better tomorrow. Amen. And you go to bed tomorrow night, and you get up the next day, God's going to make me better. And you know what? When you've reached the top of what you think is the better, then search your life. I'm sure there's still some areas that you need God to operate in. Because if you don't recognize that, those areas will pop up and let you know, oh, yeah, I'm still here. I, I want you to know you ain't that delivered. You know what I'm saying? You got some stuff we ain't dealt with yet, way in the booth in the back and in the corner and in the dark. But it all comes from this place of really needing him. Now, why am I talking about this? Because this really is going to answer a big, big question. Those trusting in their own good works under the law in order to please God are unwilling to receive the grace of God as offered by Jesus Christ. Now think about it, every one of us. While we were trusting in ourselves and religion and going to church and trusting in all the things that we set up, we couldn't hear the grace of God. There are people right now that can't hear this message of grace because they still trust in themselves. The law thought of as a means of righteousness, what it did, it, it kept men from receiving life by grace. And you know it's doing the same thing today. Uh, go back to John chapter 1, verse 12. He says, but as many as received him, verse 12, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. To these he gave power to become the sons of God. Not mere men with a perfectly righteous standing demanded by God's law, but something so much higher than the sons of God, being born of God, that you became a new order of being. You're born of God. You became a new order of being, as new and as distinct from all other creations, including man, just like Adam was when he was created in the image of God. And the angels had to ask, what is this man? But then in Romans chapter 10, Moses said that the man which doeth those things, 
those things we're referring to, go, to, go there right quick, I want you to see this, I apologize. Romans chapter 10, verse 5. Romans chapter 10, verse 5. Uh, now, I'm going somewhere. I, I'm working on something. I said I'm working on something. And, and I love the crew tonight because we, 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 you know, y'all just right there with me. You, you're on that ride. You're on that ride. I'm going somewhere with this thing, man. All right, Romans chapter 10 and verse 5. He says, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things, okay, those things of, of the law, he said, shall live by them, okay? But this life, by fulfilling the law, I mean, if it was really possible for us to fulfill the law, it's not a, it's, it's not a divine life. Fulfilling the law is not going to pro produce a divine life. To fulfill every commandment in the law of Moses, uh, in order to regulate human life, it would still put you in a position where you won't experience and see this grace. There is no provision whatsoever in the law for divine life. None. You, there is no provision in the law for divine life. Divine life is only for those who receive Jesus who is the Word, and who is the true life. That's where divine life comes from. You don't get divine life by keeping the law. It, don't, it won't happen. You only get divine life through Jesus Christ. So, it is now so necessary that we must receive Him. He must be received. He is God's unspeakable gift to be acceptable and to be accepted Whew. yeah that's good God he gave us a gift and men won't accept it <laughs> and he's saying grace is limited unless you accept the gift so here's the thing I want you to understand He's God's unspeakable gift to be accepted as being sent by God. I accept Jesus as one who was sent by God, number one. Secondly, he must be received in the capacity on which he came. How did he come? As a minister of grace and truth. I'm not talking about, oh, I just received Jesus. No, I received Jesus in the capacity as one who ministers grace and truth. Can't nobody hold this kind of grace. There was nobody to deliver. FedEx can't bring this grace. <laughs> Jesus was the only one that could. Okay, let's get real, real with this. God says, I got grace and truth. I need to get it to man. Looking around, who going to give it to man? God said, I'm the only one that can bring it to man. Because what I have to deliver to man is, whew, is who I am. And I got to figure out how to get it to him. So I'll become flesh to deliver to him this gift of grace and truth. And I say in the flesh, I receive Jesus as one who ministers grace and truth. We ain't got no problem talking about Jesus, but we do have problems dealing with what he came to be minister of. So, this is the one and the only condition that's placed upon man to become the sons of God. And what is that condition? If you believe on his name. Now, follow me carefully now. We put all this together. What does it mean? All right. How then can anyone receive him? That's the question. What does it look like to receive him? Believe upon his name. I receive him by believing him. What does that look like? Here's what it looks like. It looks like dependence. It looks like dependence. It's one thing for you to open your mouth up and say, I received Jesus. It's another thing that we look at your life and you don't depend on him 
at all. There's no dependent on him at all. So what happens is, instead of depending on Jesus, what you do is you allow the circumstances and situations around you to dig a ditch of condemnation where you line that di ditch and continue to tell yourself, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough. Or you say to yourself, this has happened to me, I don't know what I'm going to do. Or uh, my emotions are this way, I blew it, I don't know what I'm going to do. All of those are opportunities to depend on him. See, all of the stuff that messes with you is opportunity to depend on him. How does that start? Real simple, like with everything else, your mouth. Somehow, in the thick of the hell, how many of you have had days where you had some thick hell? <laughs> kind of like that thick cloud around Mount, Mount, Sinai, Mount, Mount Sinai. That's when you articulate your belief. Oh, let me see if I can get y'all to follow me. I don't even know how to deal with this thing. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know what to say. I don't know. But here's one thing I do know. Lord, help me. I believe you, and I believe on your name and your authority. I'm dependent on you. You know what that does to heaven? When your first base is God. And what you don't understand is when you don't do that, you don't get to see how real he is when stuff sometimes happens before the end of the day. I have found myself saying, boy, that was quick. And you know why I believe it was quick? Because I was quick to go to him. How quick are you to go to him? How quick are you to go? Are you still carrying something from today that you ain't went with him yet? Like you trying to, like you think you really got the answer on this thing. And you rolling it over, and you know what it's producing? Stress and worry, stress and worry, stress and worry. And you know what that's getting ready to produce? Condemnation and stress and shame. And now you ain't enough. And now self-pity now has, self-pity is a foundation for all kinds of stuff. That's why you got to stay away from it. That's, anytime you feel yourself sinking into self-pity, no, nope, I ain't going now. You'll be surprised the amount of time once you understand what I'm talking about tonight, the amount of time you will spend uh, talking to yourself. But you're not really talking to yourself, you're actually talking to God. Yeah. But the time sometimes you, you, you start talking to yourself about stuff you need to be talking to God about. <laughs> Why are you talking to yourself about... It, it, I, I really want you to see this. Yeah, I'm breaking this down like this. This happened. Lord, I depend on you. Really? Yeah. I, I don't even know what to do. I don't even know the first step. I don't even know the direction to go in. I'm just going to keep living and, 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 and help. Amen. You know how precious that is? That kind of Christian is slowly dwindling away because they've been confronted by a world that says, God don't talk to you, and you don't hear God. And you know what? Maybe at that time I ain't heard none, but I know he heard me. Because the Bible says before you even talk, he already knew what you had in your... See, in your, you know, your heart, your heart produces words. God can hear... You remember a lot of times Jesus would confront people, and Jesus said he heard their thoughts. They weren't even saying none. I, I, I used a scripture the other day, and, and I was dealing with this word importunity, how they was just begging God and pleading with God and begging God and pleading with God. And that whole situation was Jesus said this guy was saying this to himself. 
He says, but I'm not going to be that kind of friend where you got to beg me and beg me and beg me and beg me, and then he'll finally open his door and give me some bread. He said, I ain't going to be that kind of friend. Here's the kind of friend I'm going to be. Ask, you shall receive. Knock, the door going to open. See, you going to find. I'm not going to be that kind of friend where you got to beg and beg and beg. So that wasn't a comparison. It was a contrast to the type of friend you got to beg and God being your friend that he says, you ain't never got to beg me because I'm working on it even before you extend an invitation for me to get involved. You understand what I'm saying? Woo. Ah. To believe on Jesus is to depend upon him as the one through whom came grace and truth. To believe is man's response to grace. That, that your, your response to grace is to believe. You remember when Jesus said this, these group of guys came and they saw the miracle of the feeding of the fish and the bread. And they said, Lord, we want them to work miracles like you. Show me what to do. And the response was, the only work I want you to do is to believe on the one that I sent you. And we're still trying to activate our own efforts. It is that which makes it possible for God to act in grace when you believe as your response to grace. I believe that's my response to grace. Then God now begins to act. Romans 4, 16, you remember that? Um, I think it says it is, uh, it is, uh, go to verse 16, four, I think it's, it is a faith that it might be by grace, Romans 4, 16. Look at this in the NLT, Romans 4, 16. And I'm going to show you what it really says. For, he says, so the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. Now go back to the uh, King James. My faith. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. So I have faith in the grace of God. Now here's what I believe he's saying. Paraphrase this. I believe he's saying this. It is of dependence upon God that it might be by his unmerited favor and abounding provisions in love. It's, it's, it's dependence upon God that things begin to show up through his unmerited and abounding provisions in love. So, if man will not place himself in a position of dependence upon God, if you don't place yourself in a position of dependence upon God, how in the world can God provide for you according to the promptings of his love when you never put yourself in a position to depend upon God. When I saw that, I stopped and I said, okay, God, let's talk about what it looked like. And I asked myself, are you, are you ignoring the opportunities to put yourself in a position where you depend on God? Are you ignoring opportunities where you have the opportunity to put yourself in a position to depend on God. Think about that. How many opportunities today did you have to depend on God? How many opportunities will you have tomorrow to depend on God? If you don't do that, <clears throat> then it robs him of the opportunity of doing some amazing things in your life through the promptings of his love. He waiting on us. I don't know what it is about this religion that have captured people and they can't hardly let go of dependence on self. How many more years will you depend on self? I'm tired of depending on me. I want to take more opportunities to put myself in a position to depend on him. You feeling confused? There's an opportunity. You're upset? There's an opportunity. 
you're disappointed in somebody or yourself, that, that there's an opportunity. You find yourself judging somebody, that's an opportunity. I don't have time to be pointing out judgment to you and telling you how bad you are and how bad I am and how bad we all are and just all humans are going to go to hell in a handbasket. That's just not the truth. God is so ready to blow your mind. He's so ready. He just needs you to prompt his love. And that's simple. I depend on you, Lord. I'm going to go get this job. I need this job. I'm homeless without this job. God's like, you have to tell me that. I, I know. <laughs> I know. And, and you don't even know. And this is the wonderful thing about it. You can't even fathom how this is going to work. Amen. But when it does. All right, check out what it does to you. You become so big in your faith. It's like, can't nobody tell you nothing about God. I mean, it's, and you see, it's like, how is it that people have the mitigated gall to believe that there is no God? When he just showed up and did something for me that I still can't figure out how he did it. We got to quit being like God. Now, somebody, you know, they went through this thing about, well, you need to add to your faith confession. <clears throat> what was it? Uh, confession and repentance. That you really ain't saved unless you confess and repent. Now, did you repent? Well, you ain't saved then. Well, did you confess? Well, you ain't saved then. That, when you believe and depend on God, I guarantee you, it's built into belief. By pure fact that you're dependent on God, you have changed your mind. And confessing, oh, bruh, every time you see God do stuff in, in your life, oh, Lord, have mercy. I know I can't do that. I was a wretch undone. And look at what Jesus did. You get to preach to nobody around you. <laughs> I, I, I wrote something down because I, I, I thought about that, and I said, man, that is just, that ain't right. Um, Believe in Jesus Christ and to authenticate your belief, you will see repentance or change the mind. And confessing, I am a sinner and sinful and unable to, to go without a Savior, that's your dependence. It's built right in there. But we love preaching rules. I don't know, I guess, I guess we, it, it makes us feel good. No, no. Did you baptize him in the name of Jesus, or did you baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost? I was tempted one time. I said, I baptized him in the name of Fred. <laughs> oh. Dude, stop. I didn't even say nothing. I said, you believe in Jesus, he's my Lord. Get up. But for a long time, I, I've had to appe appease the religious world. I say, I baptize you. One of them believe you're baptized in the name of Jesus. Another believe you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I say, all right, I'm going to do both of them. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is none other than the name of Jesus. Is that good enough, y'all? All right, dunk them down and pull an arm up. But in actual, actually, do you really think, do you really think that's going to be the issue when you see God? You believe in your heart. You went down, you got baptized, and somebody said the, the thing you disagreed with. We got to stop all that, man. This is, this is becoming just really ludicrous. It's ridiculous how we are more focused on the doctrine and not on the love and care for the people. And I'm thinking about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Everybody was more focused on what the law of Moses said, but wasn't nobody focused on loving the, the lady. How about love the lady? Amen. How about being empathetic to the lady? Amen. The law of Moses says, slap them, <laughs> slap them. Because we're living in a generation right now, I tell you what, I got to rethink this, this Gen Z generation. 
Man, they they y'all better watch out. They 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 gonna they gonna get a hold of something. And it's gonna shock everybody. They're gonna come out preaching, prophesying, and, and flowing with the Holy Ghost. And then you're gonna be talking about your doctrine, and they're gonna like, what's that? And, and oh, that's what the Lord told me yesterday. I depend on him. I receive him. I put myself in a position to depend on him. And I will not give him a bad memory of Exodus 19 and 8. When you tell me that this, 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 I'm going to say, yeah, Lord, I can do it as long as you with me. But you'll never hear me say, I can do that. Period. Because every time he shows me, no, you can't. I'm grateful for growth. Please let me let you understand, sin has consequences. Sometimes doing stuff, they have consequences. But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't snatch away your righteousness and, um, and snatch away the good that God has done for you. People think, oh, you missed this or God, and it takes some stuff back. The Bible says the gifts and columns of God are given without repentance. Well, I used to sing, but now I can't sing because I was out there acting like a hellion. Don't blame that on God. You was preaching too hard while you was drunk at the bar and you lost, you got laryngitis. Don't blame none of that on God, now. <laughs> we're getting this, man. And we're growing for this. And I'm praying that the world will receive a revival and a move of God in the grace of God. And we will move and operate in power. You know where the power is? And this is why a lot of people don't understand when they have power. You have power to change. You have power to repent. You have power to be transformed. You have power to develop character. You have power to walk in love and to love what's not lovely. You have power to have peace in the midst of a storm. We don't see that as power. I, I don't know. We, we have too many fantasies. We're watching too many movies. We have power. Power is literally the ability to get the job done. And you have been given power. You have the ability to get the job done. That which God has anointed, wired you and equipped you to get done. We can do this, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have to be defeated by the devil, not for one split second. You want to know how to walk in power? The next time you're weak or hurt or distraught, I double dog dare you to rehearse Paul when he said, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Don't quit on God. Don't run away from the church. Don't run away from prayer. Don't run away from Bible when you had a tough time. In fact, run to the Bible as quick as you can. Run to your God as quick as you can. And you will discover a God. And you'll know what, what he meant. When I had, um, what's that? Uh, not meningitis, but uh, shingles. Yeah. I, I forgot I had meningitis, you know. I mean, he been trying to wipe me away, you know. Um, when I had shingles, I had a, uh, I had a promise I would uh, preach this meeting in Miami, Florida. And I was past the in, in infection stage, so I, I was pretty good. But that's when the, the balls were looking real good and the pain was tremendous. And so I had this big button-down shirt. And, uh, you know, I'd sit back then in, in the plane and, and the nerves would like, and I'd do that every 30 seconds. And, oh, praise the Lord, every 30 seconds. just And Oscar would just sit there and look at me. He was like, what is he doing? And Taffy was like, okay, you, you're going to preach? She's like, all right, go on. And I'm like, yeah, I need to know this. It, it, if this is the perfect time for me to know this, it, I need to know this. Or it's just going to become a scripture that I preach and people say amen to. Is this true? When I'm weak, is he strong? 
I, I didn't have any choice. I had to depend on him. Went down there. It's painful. You can see the pain in my face. I asked for a chair. And uh, I sat in a chair and I started teaching the gospel. And I had a surge of power to hit me. I jumped out that chair. And I felt the strength of God. And the revelation of God started flowing. And just in the middle of that, I wasn't feeling nothing. And got through that thing. Watch this. Minister the word. After I finished, all of it came back. <laughs> and I said again, it's true. When I'm weak, he's strong. Glory to God. See, we're still looking for the fantasy. You would prefer for that story to end up like, I jumped up, had a surge, and I walked away from there, and I was totally healed. No, I had a surge. I knew the power of God. I was able to do what I was sent there to do, and all that pain just came right back. So I think it hurt even more. <laughs> Depending on God one day, how about trying to depend on God every three minutes? How about the pain hitting your head so bad that you say, God, can you put me to sleep? And he puts you to sleep, and the yes. next thing you know, yes. it's in the morning time. Yes. And throughout the whole time, I'm like, I don't know how people are saying God's not real. Are you kidding me? He's more real than real. Yes. Somebody said, God started start. No, start came out of God. Yes. Think about what I said to you tonight. Figure out how to apply this tomorrow while you're living. And as you apply these things, as you are living, that's where the growth comes in, as you are living, not compartmentalize. Don't compartmentalize God tomorrow. Begin to praise him and position yourself on purpose to depend on him. He is so worthy to be praised. You get anything out of that tonight? So worthy to be saved. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just praise God over that. Amen. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, we're just so grateful for the word that came on this evening, just to be able to have that next level of understanding. And listen, what better way to respond to the word and completing our worship in this moment than to sow our seed, amen? To respond to the fact that we believe and we receive this grace and truth who is Jesus, amen? So if you want to give right now, there's so many ways to do that. You can lift your hand if you're in the building and the ushers will minister an envelope to you. Or you can text World Changers with the amount to 74483. You can call 1-888-866-477-7683. You can mail it, 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, Georgia, 30349. Or you can go by the web, worldchangers.org or creflodollarministries.org. Amen? Hallelujah. What a wonderful, powerful time to be able to give. And you know what? Just sitting there, it just kind of took my heart to another place where it's like, Lord, I just, I just believe. I just need you. Period. That's it. And to be able to allow your human mind to just kind of go to that place is so sweet, so precious. Let's pray over our seed. Father God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to complete our worship. Thank you, Lord, for the seed that is sown. We declare that it will go and grow in Jesus' name. And listen, before we go, we want to be able to offer the opportunity to receive and accept Jesus Christ. If you're home right now and you heard that message, or if you're in the room right now and you heard that message and you have never said, Jesus, come into my heart, if you have never received him and accepted him as your Lord and Savior, we want to take that opportunity right now. Amen? Isn't it different now that you, you, you kind of heard that that next, it's almost like that next switch. Like, I just have to believe. And everything else will line up. You just have to believe. We're offering that tonight. You just have to believe everything else.
else. You might be sitting in your home right now. I just feel that in my heart. If you're just sitting in your home right now and you're just kind of tossing and turning in between, listen, just believe. And he will turn your mindset. He will turn every situation. He will turn every, every circumstance because it will all begin to line up. Once you receive him and accept him, hey, grace and truth is kicking in. Repeat this after me if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Father, I believe. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I receive your grace that comes through believing you. You are my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, if this is the first time that you've ever said that, you've ever said Jesus come into my heart, we want you to do something for us because we want to continue to connect with you. We want you to text I am saved, I am S A V E D, to 51555. If you're home, you can do that now. If you're sitting in the room, you can do it on your phone right now. We want to send a special gift to you so that we can continue to connect with you. Amen? Well, listen, let's go ahead and stand to our feet to receive the blessing for the rest of this day, the rest of this evening, for the rest of the week. Are you excited about what God is doing? Are you excited about what God is doing? <laughs> I'm just checking. Lift your hands in the building. Father, we're so grateful for this word. We thank you, Father God, for all that you're doing. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the almighty God. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. A room filled with brilliant minds. Women gather to share and learn. Seeds of knowledge ready to bloom. Ideas blossoming as we discern. Experts, students, leaders alike, each with their own light to shine. I break the bands of trauma in the name of Jesus that's trying to snuff out your garden. There is something you felt on the inside of you that built strength within you to give you the courage to go out and do what he has signed you to do. Could you consider cooperating with the plan? Since he has done what he has done. I'm more than a conqueror. Greater is he that's on the inside of me than he that's in the world. When you begin to call those see that be not as though they were by his stripes, I am healed. But you have to make up your mind. I am ready. I'm not scared. You will not have my marriage. You will not have my mind. For we are not under the law, ladies. We are under grace. Are you ready to bloom?